Dr. Linda McDowell, who is the, the new director of the uh, National Center on Deaf Blindness, just started February 2nd, Groundhog's yeah. Day, and this is only February 16th when yeah. we're sitting at this table. Linda, thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you. Linda, tell me a little bit about your background and what brought you to the field of deaf blindness. Well, I've um, been a special education teacher most of my life, most of my work career. And my husband and I moved to Mississippi in 1989. And I took a position as a high school classroom teacher. Never had taught high school before. All the other grades that I'd taught were kindergarten and elementary school. Mostly I'd worked with students who had learning disabilities. And this high school classroom was going to be a brand new experience for me. It was students who had more significant disabilities. Um, multiple disabilities, um, pretty large variety. And when I got to the classroom, I wasn't really sure what to expect. Uh, got to know each of the students individually. And one student, um, I learned quickly, um, had a vision impairment and a, vi and a hearing impairment. And so I tried hard to figure out how she could communicate, um, how I could communicate with her, what she could let me know. And um, right away, I knew I was going to need some help uh, figuring out some things uh, on how to be a better teacher for her and to help plan her future. It was a high school classroom, and we did classroom work. We mostly were out in the community learning life skills. And I told the special education director that I was struggling and um, wanted to get some more information and so she immediately sent me to the Mississippi Deafblind Project that was housed at the university right in the town where I was and the staff came and provided me a wealth of strategies and ongoing training over the course of the four years I had with this student and uh, it was tremendous help to me and uh, I was able to uh, get to know the family um, and just on and on. It was incredible to be connected to that wealth of information. And from that one student, you were inspired to continue in this field. What was it about that interaction or that particular set of new skills that, that sort of made you more passionate about oh. deaf blindness? Difficult question. Uh, Good. I think... <laughs> uh, Actually, the set of, probably the set of strategies that were offered to me because of, of Chrissy, um, I found worked with many of the other students. There was another student in the room, for instance, who didn't really have an effective way of communicating, and uh, he didn't use words to speak. Um, so he was sometimes misunderstood, even though he was incredibly uh, able with his body to, to communicate certain things, but um, some of the very same strategies that I was being encouraged to use with Chrissy worked for him as well. And, and really it was on and on. There were just a set of strategies that were, being, that were taught to me on, um, uh, that, that made sense for the rest of the students in my classroom. So I just kept digging for more, mm -hmm. and I found a whole field and a whole wealth of of, of information that could just help me be a better teacher. Another thing that was a big part of those early years of training on that were the, the importance played on uh, making sure that the family uh, was a part of the planning on what would, to focus on, what to prioritize, and come to an agreement where they would be also using those same, that same set of priorities, the same set of strategies at home and in the community. And uh, the children uh, or students uh, that, that have deaf blindness, am I saying that right? Students with deaf blindness? There's a couple of ways to say uh -huh. it and often we end up, um, we, not often, uh, all the time we end up asking individuals themselves who are deaf blind or with deaf blindness how 
um, they want the rest of us to refer to that particular disability. Uh, so um, you can say it as you choose. Um, so in this context, I'll say that, so students, have you found that students with deaf blindness or who have deaf blindness, um, that there's deafness or that there's hearing impairment or visual impairment in the family or is this oftentimes a, a brand new concept for the family? Oh, it it's generally comes as a surprise mm -hmm. <laughs> to a family. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of times there will be other disabilities as well along with the vision and the hearing uh, impairment. There will also be a physical disability health issues. There's such a variety. Every student is so very individual. Every student is just so very unique. You know, it's just fun to finally find a way to understand what's important and what motivates and uh, what the interests are of each individual student. Yeah, when uh, those of us not in the field, when we think of deaf blindness, we think of Helen Keller. Right. And um, it, it doesn't appear as if she had other uh, disabilities, learning disabilities, and those sorts mm -hmm. of things. So obviously the, the range of, of what would be considered deaf blindness is really wide. It is, it, it, it is, and I still can't say it often enough that it's about getting to know the, the person um, first because there's such degrees of loss and um, degrees of, of abilities. It's just a, every, every person is so very different. And so from this one child in this class, you got some skills and strategies. You created an interest or a passion in you. How did you find yourself to the National Center on Deaf Blindness? Well, this particular state project, the Mississippi Deaf Blind Project, was very nearby, uh, was housed at the university nearby the high school where I was working. The university faculty uh, that was there in the special education department started having me come and do more and more guest lectures in their classrooms. And I've just specifically on this topic. Well, not on deaf blindness, mm -hmm. but um, just transition to adult uh, life. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to um, students who will need lifelong support um, to be a part of the community and work. And uh, so they persuaded me to come on back to school. Uh, so that's when I worked on my doctoral degree. And I stayed involved with uh, the Deaf Blind Project. Um, was on their advisory board. And I think I was just so passionate about just believing in all that they had to offer a state as far as the technical assistance to families and, and teachers that I wanted to do everything I could to spread the word. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just continued to learn too. They would hold workshops and things and the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, I stayed in connected. Um, when I graduated, I went to work at the Institute for Disability Studies and uh, I was contacted by some of the faculty that still was there in that academic department. Would I please consider coming and being the director of the Deaf Blind Project? I so believed in the help that um, our state project could give to teachers around our state and to the families. So I, I really wanted to be a part of that. And that opportunity when they invited me to come and consider directing, um, the first step was to then get really connected to the National Center and uh, get some training, more training, mm -hmm. on what projects needed to be doing. And um, at that point, it was the first time to meet all the, the different people in the network uh, that I've stayed in touch with ever since. Mm -hmm. So when you got involved with the Deaf Blind Project and then associated with the National Center on Deaf Blindness in that mm -hmm. network, was there anything that surprised you did they, did oh, they, yeah, yeah. So I, I won't, was, I, I don't need um, to finish that question. <laughs> I, you know, I'd been uh, in my career in special education, I'd, I'd been with groups um, of people uh, that you share a common interest, um, and so you get excited about being together. But I think somehow in the world of deaf blindness, and uh, I don't know what it why it was so, but what surprised me was that it felt like you walked into a family of people. Um, I think once people entered the world 
of uh, just trying to figure out what works <laughs> mm -hmm. and how to connect. Anyway, when you walk into this group of people, they take you in. It's like, wow, so you really do get it. You really are inspired by this and you want to stay with this and you want to learn more. Um, the next time you show up for a group meeting um, nationally, mm -hmm. it's like a homecoming and people are just so, and all that warmth and that connection uh, just surprised me that it could be so rich and so deep and, uh, and it and stayed. So welcoming. <laughs> Yeah. That's, yeah. Now, deaf blindness. Uh, if I'm if I'm correct, it's probably the uh, uh, lowest incident disability. Well, one of the reasons it's cons it's still a low incidence is it's still very difficult um, in each state of the nation for the count to be accurate. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, some people that may only have just a small amount of vision impairment and a small amount of hearing impairment, although they are impacted by both, may not even raise their hand and identify, you know, uh, so they're not counted. And that's true of all ages. Mm -hmm. um, so the count is a little bit tricky. Um, <laughs> those students that I mentioned I have typically worked with who have other disabilities are often labeled as someone with multiple, a child with multiple disabilities, a student with multiple disabilities. So, so once they're again, not on they're not list. necessarily counted either. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the shame of that is then some of those wonderful strategies that were first given to me when I had a student who had the label. <laughs> so I knew I could ask for those strategies as a teacher, um, if you don't know that you can ask and there's a set of strategies out there, you won't be able to use them. And um, there's not the learning and there's mm -hmm. not the communication and all the things that can happen when you use the appropriate strategies mm -hmm. that we know work. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, how did you find your way to being the director <laughs> of the National Center on Deaf Blindness and it move from Mississippi to uh, Monmouth, Oregon. Yeah. Who would Welcome want to, to move beautiful to Oregon? <laughs> Oregon is beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's the passion I have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, I feel like um, one of the things that I've enjoyed the most over the years, besides being a part of this family as a state project director, was the fact that when we do get together uh, as individual states, we are always searching for ways of how we can be um, better at what we do by being a strong network. Our, our deafblind field is bigger than the technical assistance. We're also in partnership with um, personnel preparation programs, mm -hmm. uh, university programs mm -hmm. that are in uh, the business of training teachers, um, the training of um, these paraeducators is critical as well. So I think because I've always loved figuring out how we can all really work together <laughs> to strengthen our national um, network, mm -hmm. um, that uh, it was just a matter of time before I'd come here <laughs> and get up in this mix of um, the national center, which our, our goal is to, to really uh, do all we can to make this an effective network. Um, there are state projects doing marvelous things mm -hmm. as the one that first helped me and um, we need to be able to share with one another um, our ideas and our experiences as um, our knowledge just continues to grow um, mm -hmm. how to help each and every one of the kids out there. One, one final question. Uh, and thank you so much for, uh, for, for doing this with <laughs> us and, um, and letting us get to know you and, and, and letting us welcome you to the campus at Western Oregon University. I feel very welcome here. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you could make one change or one advancement in the field of deaf blindness, I might be putting you on the spot uh -huh. here, but if you one. could like <laughs> wave a magic wand and say, I wish that this happened. Mm -hmm. Is there something that you would say this is it? I do. I think um, it would make a huge difference um, if we in our nation 
recognize deaf blindness as an educational category area that then required um, each and every school district to hire a teacher who is trained in those deaf blind strategies and an intervener who could be the one on one with that young child and help them know what was going on, accessing things, knowing what's happening. And uh, if we could get that recognized, mm -hmm. um, then it would show up on their individual educational plans that these things needed to be in place. And I think we could see um, a whole, uh, um, a huge amount of increased um, learning for those students and, and just uh, the families want it. <laughs> All of mm -hmm. us who are supporting the families and the teachers that are out there now want that. And so I, I hope we can get there. Thank you so Thank very you so much, much and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. And we'll meet you here again at this very same table as I interview other directors at Teaching Research Institute. Thanks.